All right, so now we begin our next unit, unit B, which is in dynamics. And dynamics composes of things that involve forces. And so what we're going to do in this is we're going to break down the idea of what is a force, um, and then beyond what is a, a force, who are the major thinkers in this, such as Galileo and Isaac Newton, and then what are their contributions and what are their thoughts on forces and dynamics and how does this work? And then in terms of just defining some general terminology that we're going to be using going forward, this lesson is extremely critical. Now, I'm also going to be referencing some uh, lesson videos that will be in the description below. I want you to interchangeably, when I ask you to go to those videos, I want you to click those links in the way that I say them after certain points in this lesson, just because they help tie together some of the concepts we're going to be talking about. Now, in the first part here, when we talk about a force, a force is simply when we have some sort of push or pull on an object in a given direction. And it's really critical we see this as a vector value or something that includes direction. So I'm going to make sure I put the F with the vector symbol, just like we saw in previous units when it came to velocities, when we talked about acceleration, when we talked about displacement, those things all included direction and force is no different. We need to include direction because direction, it's going to matter, especially when we start talking about net forces. Now, right away, we want to jump into this idea where Galileo goes into this thought experiment and says, what if we have some sort of object that is pushed across a table and maybe we have some sort of pattern where we experience the following. So Galileo says, what if I put together this thought experiment where we put together a thought experiment that involves a ramp and a ball that is going backwards and forwards on this ramp? Well, what Galileo thought is that if this thing is in the absence of friction, what this should do is the ball should roll backwards and forwards, and it should do this infinitely where the height of the ball is maintained. And as it goes back and forwards, it goes back to that same height. And so we could call this dotted line here the height value, and I'll just clean that up just a bit here. So this can be our height value, and it maintains this height where we could even think about this in terms of a unit C terminology. If I look at this, this is some sort of initial energy, this is some sort of final energy, and that energy is being maintained between this. And this only happens where it goes from one height to the other if there's an absence of friction or air resistance. Otherwise, what we would notice is that this ball would eventually just stop and it would be somewhere down here. If we did have friction, and I'm going to put in brackets, if we had friction, then the ball would end up somewhere down there in the gully because eventually it would go backwards and forwards and it would be losing energy, losing energy, the height would be getting lower and lower and to the point that the ball just comes to rest. But in Galileo's thought experiment, he said, in the absence of friction and air resistance, this ball should just keep going backwards and forwards. Now, one thing I want you to annotate here and that you should notice is that when we're looking at this, as the ball is in this category here, or the section where it's going down the ramp, we would say that this is speeding up or gaining speed. So I'm just going to say speeding up to really simplify it. On the other side, when we look at the EF category or where it's going up the ramp, this is going to be where it is slowing down. And so I think it's important just to include those titles there. Reason is because we're getting this oscillation between speeding up and slowing down and speeding up and slowing down as it's going backwards and forwards. But in the green here, I just simply described it in terms of what is happening on the way down here what is happening on the way up on the other side. Because then obviously once this ball goes from B to A, it's gonna flip these titles and you know all of that will hold constant. Now, Galileo took this a step further and said, what if I lower the incline of the ramp? Namely, what if I make this a less steep slope? Well, we would notice that the ball, in the absence of friction and air resistance again, would go to that same height again. But the major difference is, is that rather than it being speeding up and slowing down in the same magnitude, what we would notice is that this area would actually be a slower speed. So this would be a slower speed or velocity. And I'm going to say just a slower speed for the most part, just in the case of this one, just to talk about its magnitude. It would be a slower speed as it goes up the ramp. But what we notice is that it goes further up the ramp in terms of overall distance but in terms of the overall vertical height, it goes to the same spot. And again, because we're saying that in the absence of friction and air resistance, this thing is maintaining its energy and it's going backwards and forwards and maintaining that potential energy if we really wanted to title it that way. Now, Galileo just takes this one step further and says, what if we take this and we say, okay, in the absence of friction or air resistance, 
and this incline is completely flattened to the point where we have a ramp and it goes down the ramp and then it infinitely goes in the right direction for the example that we're dealing with here. Well, if this was the case, then there would be nothing to stop the ball. Once it's given this energy or once it's given this motion, it's going to go down the ramp. And then once it gets to the bottom of the ramp, just to draw this in here, it's going to be something that has some sort of initial velocity in the right direction. And with this velocity, unless there is friction or air resistance, then this ball would slow down. But in this case, the hypothesis around this is that the ball would just infinitely go in the right direction and there'd be nothing to stop it. So what I'm going to do to indicate that is typically in real life, we would say, oh, okay, there's a force of friction or an FF. And I just really want to make sure that's neat. So we're good here. So there would be an FF or a force of friction. But without this force of friction, and the way I'm going to represent that is by putting a circle and a line through it. Without that force of friction, this thing should go on in perpetuity or go on forever at that constant speed that it reached when it was at the bottom of the ramp. All right. Now, what I recommend is I want you to pause here and I want you to click the first link in my description, which will take you to a second video that describes this exact scenario and just gets you thinking again about the Galileo experiment and what was being proposed. So pause the video here, click that first link, check it out. Okay, now that you're back here, what we're going to do is we're going to push forward and we're going to take the ideas of Galileo and then introduce Isaac Newton into this and say, well, how does Isaac Newton take these ideas of Galileo and push them forward? And we look at it in the following way. Galileo states this as the law of inertia, the law of inertia being if something is already in motion, it wants to stay in that motion. But then if the object is at rest, it wants to remain at rest. And so we see this idea where inertia or this idea of something having mass is resistance of motion or the ability to stay in motion and wanting to stay in motion. And that's a very, very big part. In fact, that's Isaac Newton's first law, which we want to be very, very careful here with. Okay, now let's introduce Isaac Newton and his thought process here. So Isaac Newton, who was born on the same day that Galileo died, which is incredible, including their uh, significant contributions to science and how they were directly connected to one another, Isaac Newton extends upon Galileo and says, what if we have this idea where not only do we have the law of inertia, which is the ability of something to stay in motion or stay at rest, we can also now have the idea of an unbalanced force and an unbalanced force that causes some sort of acceleration to an object. And so really, really critical here. And if you want to highlight even more detail here, we could say, however, if the forces acting on an object are unbalanced, the object will accelerate in the direction of the unbalanced force. That is such a critical line. So tying those two things together, unbalanced forces causes object to accelerate. And what we're going to learn is that this is Newton's second law of motion. And lastly, Newton continues forward and says, what if two objects interact? So suppose we have the situation where ball A is interacting or moving towards ball B. So A has some sort of a velocity and hits B. Well, we can get a couple different situations out of here and those could be highlighted below and I'll even annotate and explain what these are here. So we could get the following situation. The first one being A hits B and then they collide and they separate apart where A goes in the left direction, B goes in the right. That's one uh, situation of a collision. The second collision that we could have would be what if A and B hit together? So I'm going to annotate this as A and B. When they hit together, they hit and stick and move in the same direction. So now they're moving as one unit. The other case scenario we're going to have is where A is now stationary, but B absorbs the energy and continues in the right direction. These are the three situations of collisions. And for now, we're not actually going to go into these in heavy detail. These are typically discussed in a lot of detail in the Science 20 course, um, Science 30, and then even Physics 30. But for Physics 20, we don't go into a lot of collision work, so don't expect to be dealing with these specific types. Just know we're going to deal with a lot of third, um, third law problems or Newton third law of motion because we want to get specific on this idea where we have some sort of equal but opposite force interaction that is happening between something. Or if I or if I exert a force on some object, that uh, that object will then absorb or exert a force in the reverse direction. I know that's a mouthful. These three laws are a lot to deal with. So um, don't worry, we're going to become experts on these very shortly. Okay, now we're going to highlight star box. I really, really need you to realize that this slide will determine the rest of the semester right here. 
These three laws of motion, or Newton's three laws of motions, are critical. They're used in unit B, C, and D, and they outline how we approach problems in terms of are we talking about an F net? Are we talking about an F net being zero? Are we talking about equal and opposite reactive forces? What are we talking about? These are all broken down in the three laws. Now, let's start off with the first one here. Newton's first law of motion, or the law of inertia. This law of inertia says that if an object is at rest, it wants to stay at rest. If an object is uh, in motion, it wants to stay in motion. Or more formally, an object will continue to be at its state of rest or uniform motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And the way we formalize that is the following. We're going to say, according to first law, the force net or the F net is equal to mass times acceleration. But if this object is at rest or in constant motion, that means there's no acceleration. Acceleration is zero, and thus we have an, a balanced force where it is zero newtons. And so in brackets here, I just really want you to put that where this is a balanced force. Or the forces are balanced, if you really want to put it. But I'm just going to put balanced forces. There we go. And you can close the bracket. So when I get an F net of zero, it means all the forces in the situation are balanced. Now, Newton's second law extends this and says, well, what if instead of dealing with balanced forces, now we're dealing with unbalanced forces and how this affects objects? Well, we know that this is going to cause the object to accelerate in the direction of the overall net force. So if one force is greater than another, well, we should expect to see the object accelerate in the direction of that greater force. One thing we're going to break down here is the idea of proportionalities coming up, and proportionalities deal with this alpha symbol. So if you need to write this in your notes for yourself, alpha or this uh, Greek symbol for A, alpha represents the proportionalities or inverse proportionalities for any given equation. Now, in this first equation here, you may be thinking like, why are they saying that acceleration is directly proportional to the magnitude of the net force and acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass? Like, where are they getting these? Well, what we're going to do is in the uh, blank here below, I want you to write F net is equal to MA. And now in class, I would have proposed this thought to you. I would have said, well, how do they get this idea that A is proportional to whatever? We have to isolate A by dividing away M. So this is going to be F net is equal to um, or not F net is equal to, but acceleration is equal to F net divided by the mass. And now what we can do is individually study this. If A is directly proportional to the force or the force net, what we're going to do is we're going to say that if A and F net are both in the numerator, then whatever I do to the F net directly affects A in the same magnitude. So let's do an example here. What if I want to figure out A2? And A2 is a new acceleration dependent on a force. Well, the new acceleration in this case would be proportional to, let's say I multiply the F by 2. It's going to be 2 times the force. Well, what does this mean? We have to take the original force, or original acceleration, I should say, and multiply it by 2. So this is like saying the new acceleration, A2, is proportional to double the force. What does that mean we're doing? Just multiply your original acceleration by 2. Now, similarly, if I look at the inverse proportional pr principle, which deals with mass, it says that if mass is in the denominator, then if I multiply mass or increase the mass or even decrease the mass, it's going to have a certain property, and it's inversely proportional to acceleration. Whatever I do down here is going to eventually divide or potentially multiply the acceleration, but for the most part, what we can simplify this and say is the greater the mass, the less the acceleration, and then vice versa, the less the mass, the greater the acceleration. So we're just going to put in an example here. What if I wanted to talk about acceleration 2? I could write in that the acceleration 2 is proportional to 1 divided by 2m. Let's say I double my mass. Well, what this is essentially doing is it's saying I have my original acceleration a1, and I'm dividing it by 2. Or you could even say that it is 1 half the original acceleration. That would be one way to view that. But just knowing that the mass, is, if it increases, it affects acceleration because acceleration decreases. If the mass goes down and it becomes an object with less overall matter composition, then the acceleration is going to be a lot quicker and it would increase. And we're going to see cases and scenarios of that, but just be aware that this alpha symbol means proportional. Now, or inversely proportional, depending on what type of variable we're talking about. And again, we've already isolated for this formula here, so it's not like we have to redo this again. This is just saying acceleration is equal to the forces over mass. Now, we can go down here and look at our formula. F net is equal to mass times acceleration. And the one really important thing they do here is they include all the units. 
we're going to consider our forces to be measured in newtons, our acceleration to be measured in meters per second, just like it was in kinematics, and our mass to be measured in kilograms. It's really important to know that these are the standardized units. So we have a kilogram, we have a second, and we have a meter. And then if you know all these things come together, these are the uh, key elements or the key units that represent all the units that mix together in order to make a Newton or to make some sort of force. So if you have a problem where it's dealt with in uh, grams, you're going to need to convert that. If it's given to you in hours, we're going to want to make it seconds. And then if it's given to you in like kilometers or millimeters, whatever it is, we need to make sure this is in meters so that we're getting our standardized units that are really critical for us. Okay, so that's the second law. It says, if I have some sort of F net, well, this it must be an unbalanced force. And what I should do actually is, I'm just going to clarify this a little bit more up here. When we have an unbalanced force, you can even include this in your notes and say, your F net is equal to mass times acceleration, making sure I have my vector symbols above both of these, where the acceleration is not equal to zero. In this case, we do have acceleration. An unbalanced force causes acceleration unlike our example of first law where it is zero acceleration thus balanced forces so we have unbalanced forces all right lastly we go into newton's third law where we see this and we see okay well newton's third law means that the, we have the following whenever an object exerts a force on a second object the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first object so there's this equal and opposite relationship which is really nice now Something we can note here is that forces always occur in pairs. We have each force on the pair acts different on the object, or each force of the pair acts different acts on a different object, I should say, to really specify that. And then the third point, which is probably the most critical, is each force of the pair is equal to the magnitude, but opposite in direction. Meaning, if there's 20 newtons in one direction, then there is 20 newtons in the other. And the one we mentioned in class was, I push on a wall with 20 newtons, the wall responds back with 20 newtons in the opposite direction. That's an equal and opposite in terms of equal magnitude, but opposite direction. Okay, now we look at the examples here, and here's a quick little thought experiment. I know the answers are below, but we may as well include a visual for these. What is the reaction force to a person pushing her hand against the wall? Well, we would immediately go to this and say, if the hand is being pressed against the wall, then the wall is going to exert a force that is in the reverse direction. So the wall on the hand. There we go. Now, when walking across a floor, what is the direction your force, uh, what is the direction of the force of your foot on the floor? What is the reaction force? Which force propels you forward? And then what would happen if friction is eliminated? Well, here's the case scenario we have. So your foot applies a pressure on the, on the floor. So this would be the force of your foot on floor. And then if you apply force to the floor, the floor is then going to respond back by third law with this force of the uh, floor on the wall, or floor on the foot, I should say. There we go. And then when they talk about this idea of what would happen if the friction between your foot and the floor became zero, you just wouldn't move. Point blank, you just wouldn't move because there's nothing that is going to be an equal and opposite force to propel you forward. In fact, there's some funny videos out there of some people that run on ice, and it's this idea that you would just be running in place. The friction is what allows you to propel yourself forward. The friction is that equal and opposite force that is returning your uh, foot into the forward direction. It's giving you that push in the equal and opposite direction. So you apply force to the floor. The, uh, the friction and as well as the floor provide a force in return that propels you forward. So it's really important to know that friction has a high impact on your ability to move and more importantly, move sideways, move front to back, a mixture of movements, even jumping in the air, all that other stuff. Friction is very critical. Without it, you wouldn't be able to move in the different directions. Now, our last one right here is what if an apple is pulled down towards the earth from a tree? So meaning it falls off the tree, um, and maybe it's grown to full size, it falls off the tree. They say, what is the reaction force as this apple falls to the earth? Well, what we would immediately say is that if this is falling, and this is falling with some sort of force due to gravity, we have some sort of equal force that is being pulled uh, where the earth is going towards the apple. So I'm going to say it's the force of earth towards the apple. 
Now, what you should be noticing is that these are all third law problems, where we're talking about a force being exerted from one object on another, and then that second object exerts a force on the other object. Okay, now, another couple critical de uh, definitions we're going to need moving forward with this. The first one being the following. We want to make sure that we don't interchange mass and weight. So this is a really critical thing to highlight. Do not use these interchangeably. They're used interchangeably in everyday language, but we want to be careful with this. And I'll even highlight that part. In everyday language, we interchange them, but in physics, they mean something totally different. And so if you really need to highlight that for yourself and then highlight some of these sections, here we go. The first part, mass. Mass is the amount of matter within an object. It has nothing to do with the forces applied to the earth or the force you apply downwards. No, mass is simply inertia. It's the ability of an object to stay in motion or stay at rest. It's the matter composition of the object. Where this differs is we talk about weight or the force due to gravity. By its equation alone, you can already see that we take mass and multiply it by the gravity of whatever situation it's in. And this force due to gravity is simply saying, how much force do you apply down on the object? Or how much force do you apply to another object with relation to your mass and the given gravity of the uh, scenario or the given uh, situation, the environment? I want to be very particular about that down here. When we look at mass, mass is just independent. It's one of those things where no matter where you are, you could be five galaxies away, you could be on Mars, you could be on Jupiter, you could be on Earth. Your mass or your matter composition doesn't change, but what does change is that your gravity changes depending on where the object is, meaning the acceleration due to gravity is different on the Earth, it's different on the Moon, and it's different on Mars. It's different in all three of these situations because a lot of this gravitational field strength, as we're going to get to call it, so you could even write this in as like a preemptive note for unit C and D, you look at this and our gravitational field strength, or GFS, is determined by the mass of the object. So the Earth is more massive than the Moon and Mars. And so that has a big indication on what the acceleration of an object would be when it interacts with this larger mass. One thing I'm going to get you to indicate on the bottom here, and I just want to kind of switch up your framework a little bit. Typically from kinematics, when we indicated that we had a negative acceleration, we said, okay, well, we can calculate Fg, which is m times g, and you know our gravity, which was 9.81 in a lot of our free fall problems, or negative 9.81, we considered it to be, oh, it's going in the downwards direction, so therefore it should have a negative. Where I'm going to get you to change your framework and your thought process a little bit is I want you to cancel out that negative and move it out front, move it out front, move it out front. The reason is, is because what we're going to do is we're going to start classifying forces as a positive force or a negative force. Is the force going in the downwards direction or is the force going in a positive direction? And then we don't have to account for any negatives in terms of acceleration. We don't have to account for any negatives in terms of velocities that might be applied here. I mean, we'll have to be careful with that, of course. But when we decide that a force is negative versus some sort of gravity is negative, it actually allows us to solve these things algebraically in a little bit better of a way. So what I'm going to do is just trust me for now when I say I want you to make these forces negative. And so I'm going to say the force being negative, when we talk about the Fg or the force due to gravity on Earth, we typically relate that the object is going in the downwards direction or the force applied is downwards. So this negative simply implies that this is down. And then rather than having to do the acceleration negative, now we just know forces as negative and we can just simply use the acceleration as a magnitude. But if you go that other way where you make the accelerations negative, sure, you can go that way. But I'm telling you, when we start combining these uh, forces together in terms of FNET statements, this might be a really uh, good strategy that might eliminate some of these like double negative or sign errors that you might be thinking about here. Okay, lastly, we just want to break down some forces that we might see throughout this unit. So starting off with the first one, a force applied. A force applied is actually quite simple. By definition, an applied force indicates we have a force that is a push or a pull on an object. Now, this can happen in a couple of different ways. It can be a horizontal push. It can be a horizontal uh, pull. Uh, it could be a vertical push or pull. So I even want to indicate that on here. I know it's a little bit clustered on the diagram here, but we could say we have some sort of vertical pull. We could have some sort of vertical push, which would be like an FA like this. Um, all those, those don't happen a ton, you know, we may as well write it in there because it could be vertical or horizontal. And then the thing that you're going to recognize right over here is, hey, look at this. We get a triangle where we break it into components. Be prepared to deal with component method again.
So I'm gonna say component method because we may see that component method makes a rise again, once again in this case. So component method, we break apart our, our FA because it's on an angle, just like we did in inclines or not inclines, well, we will talk about them in inclines, but just like we talked about in projectile motion, in projectile motion, we always broke apart the VI into the different components. For this case scenario, we're breaking apart forces instead of velocities, but the principles that underlie this are gonna be the very same, and you're gonna actually see that in lesson 12. So very shortly, be prepared to break apart forces. For now, it's okay, we're, we can leave it at this, and you're gonna see that there's a lot of crossover from the material we've already done. Now, a really simple one here is force of friction. Force of friction is just another type of force, and really simply put, it is the resistance force. It opposes motion. So if I'm trying to drag something across the ground, what holds it back? The force of friction. The force of friction, the contact between the surface and the object, really, really causes this almost like stickiness where the object resists the motion. And so we're gonna get lots into that. Namely, this happens a lot on inclines and horizontal surfaces, um, but we'll, we'll get into that as well. Last thing, the normal force. This is a really important one. The normal force is the contact force that forms a 90 degree or perpendicular angle um, or perpendicular line to the given surface. And what I mean by that is, my force normal is always a response force to some sort of object interacting with a horizontal surface. So I can create this here where Fn is formed by this perpendicular line where this is 90 degrees. So it's perpendicular to the horizontal surface. Now, right away, here's one thing I would say. If I have this rabbit and it's sitting on the desk in front of us and I have an Fg, which is the weight of the rabbit, and the rabbit is pushing down with this some sort of Fg, the Fn is a responding force. If this rabbit is sitting perfectly on the desk and not floating away or crashing through the desk, aka I can even visualize this, if the rabbit's not like floating way up here or like crashing through the surface here, what would we say about the forces? Well, they must be balanced forces, the Fn and the Fg. And so I really want you to highlight too, that if I look at these, the Fg is balanced with the Fn and thus the rabbit perfectly sits on this uh, horizontal surface, whatever this might be. Now, something you're gonna wanna draw in your uh, picture here is the following, or something you're gonna wanna draw in your notes is the following. I want you to draw a triangle that looks like the following. So here's our triangle, and it represents some sort of inclined surface. I'm gonna draw an object on this inclined surface, and I'm gonna just draw it as like some sort of wooden block or even a rectangle on this surface. Well, what we could do immediately is we could break this apart into its Fnet diagram, or more importantly, we can break it into its force diagram or its free body diagram. So if you ever hear me say force diagram or free body diagram, it's the composition of all the forces on a diagram that represents the situation. So starting off with the first one, the one that is perpendicular to the horizontal surface, where the horizontal surface is here, if I have a perpendicular force, this automatically means that this is the Fn going in the upwards direction. Now, the other thing that impacts this, I could draw some sort of force that's in the straight down. And a lot of you in class said this very quickly, this is our Fg. So we have some sort of Fn, which is perpendicular to the surface. We have an Fg that goes straight down. Force due to gravity should typically be straight down. But I challenged you all and I said, is this Fg negative 9.81 or more importantly, just 9.81 meters per second squared? And you all very quickly said no. And the reason is because on an incline, it's not in free fall. So it's not falling at the same rate of standard gravity, which is 9.81. So what we need to do is we need to break this into the components in order to see what is happening in this diagram. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it apart just like we did in kinematics. So I break it apart into a Y component or what we're gonna call FGY. I break it apart into FGX, which is our horizontal component. Now that we've broken it into components where our angle is on this interior section here, I'll even draw a little theta. I want you to now think about what two forces in the vertical direction are balanced. And in class, it was very well done. Fn and Fgy, you told me those were equal. And the reason is because unless this red block is flying off the surface, it's going like way over here, it's zipping over here, or if it's crashing through the incline, we must know that Fn and Fgy are equal because or else this object wouldn't stay along that horizontal incline as it's sliding down. So I want you to say somewhere below here is that if we look at these forces, we can say that our Fn is equal to the FGY 
or the vertical component of gravity for our triangle here. And you could arrow over to that. Now, the other thing I want you to notice here is what is the force that's contributing to the horizontal motion? We actually only have one force. Typically, we'd have friction, but for now, let's simplify our definition. Fgx is our force that causes this to go down the incline, or the force due to gravity in the x direction causes this to go down the incline, where Fn and Fgy are balanced, keeping the object on this same vertical uh, plane or in the same vertical direction and not flying off the incline or crashing through. It slides down vertically perfectly, but then the Fgx is causing it to go down. Now, two very, very important things here. What we want to do is we first of all want to discuss the idea of please do not confuse Fn and Fnet. I will never, never, never write Fnet as Fn. Ever, ever, ever. You'll never see me in the notes do that. If I do that, please call me out right away because Fnet and Fn are not the same thing. The net force is the combination of forces. Fn is one of the forces. The last thing we want to discuss here is the following. Fn is equal to Fg only on horizontal surfaces. In the example, the bunny example, where it's strictly horizontal, it forms a 90 degree, the bunny has an FG and an FN, they're equal. But if, and if we have a situation that represents some sort of incline or an angle, we can no longer say FN equals FG. Rather, what we just de derived from this is we said that FN, or the normal force, is equal to FGY, which is the force due to gravity in the Y direction. It's that Y component or the vertical component of gravity that perfectly balances the Fn or that contact force. All right, now here's where you're really gonna wanna get your practice done. There's a lot of conceptual practice problems that just get you thinking. They're not a ton of numbers, but they say, okay, if I give you certain situations that involve these theories, whether it be Galileo, Newton, the three laws of Newton, um, more importantly, types of forces in involved in that and how they work, can you answer questions that are a little bit more theoretical? And that's going to be very critical moving forward in unit B, C, and D, is that you're always thinking about the more theoretical side and how it ties into all the math you're going to be doing.